All right, so if you're here from my last video, I promised you guys that I would give a rundown on uh, all basic equipment and gear and uh, general how-tos on uh, what to do when you're going after these fish, uh, that being paddlefish or AKA spoonbill. Um, I'm gonna try to get through this as quick as I can, not ramble on, but uh, hit on all the points you need to know. I'm by no means a professional at this. I'm just gonna tell you guys what I've learned as I've gone along. First recommendation I have for everybody is get you a good backpack. You don't need a lot of gear, just pretty much hooks and weights. And a pair of pliers when it comes to this but the gear that you're going to have is inherently heavy so you don't want to be carrying it in a hand uh, that's going to cramp up on a long walk because it is usually a long walk into these spots now as far as uh, rod and reel size this is uh, one of my more recent ones I've got there's two different size rod and reel setups that I like to use so I've got my eight foot I believe this is a medium or medium heavy yeah I got the eight foot medium surf rod running a 6,000 spinning reel. And I like that for anywhere that I'm having to you know, cast short. It's more than enough power for me to winch in any of the fish that we're gonna get on, you know, up to 100 plus pounds. Um, the only time that I use the bigger setup, which is a 10 foot surf rod, uh, which is a medium heavy, uh, with my 8,000 Pin Pursuit 3, is if we need to cast far. And that's because I put a heavier weight on it and I can really sling it out there. Now, the line I run on both those, I prefer 50 pound braid. You can get these fish in with anything from 30 to 80. To me, 50 works great because it's hit, it kind of hits it down the middle. You can get good casting distance, but you've got enough power to really be able to horse them in if you want to. As far as the rig goes that you're gonna tie, I, this is the question I get the most. I've had a lot of people request that I show this more and talk about the fish more and all this in my other videos. And you just don't have time when you're fighting fish in a five plus minute fight every time. I don't have time to fit this stuff in one video. So that's why we're doing a separate video today. I don't like to do a lot of these and I hope that I don't have to, but this has been specially requested, so I will. So what you're gonna start out doing is uh, when it comes to weights, you're gonna run anything from a two ounce up to a five ounce, and that's gonna depend on casting distance you need versus current and depth. Now, if you've got a lot of current and a lot of, or a lot of depth, you need more weight to get down further. In my opinion, the two to three ounce it, it is gonna get you the best casting distance. I would say three ounce is probably peak casting distance. Um, so that's what I prefer to run. As far as hooks, I like to use a 10 aught treble hook. Um, the law here in Oklahoma is they have to be barbless or you have to have the barb smashed flat. Now, typically I order my 10 aughts barbless, but we've all been in that situation. Even if you order barbless or you make your own barbless, we've all been in the situation where you need more hooks that you don't have. So you stop by Walmart or Academy, and all they've got is barbed hooks. Okay, that's easily remedied. It's the whole reason I carry a pair of pliers with me is not because it's hard to get these fish unhooked, because it's not with a barbless hook falls right out. It's for smashing barbs. So you take your pliers. What I do is just smash this barb flat. Sometimes they'll just pop right off. I know you heard that ping. They'll pop right off, but I like to kind of give them a twist, really smooth them out as much as I can, because... I'm not just trying to follow the law here. I want to hurt these fish as little as possible because I don't keep them. All my fish are catch and release, so I want to do as little damage as I can. All right. Just like that. Give it a smash. And then give her a twist. Like I say, some of them barbs will pop off when you smash them. Some of them, it just smashes them flat. Either way is fine. You're doing the job. You're following the law. And you end up with like that right there. Okay, smash flat, almost no barb whatsoever. Tie your weight directly on, just like you tie a hook on any other rig. Go up six inches or so, eight inches, whatever. Double your line over, run it through the eye of your hook. That creates your loop. You then take your weight, drop it through your loop, pull it tight right there at the top, slip it to the length you want. I usually make it about a foot right there so that when I go under, you go under through the crease of the treble, and then you can wrap it and then you can go under again and get your length right and you can wrap it again and when you're ready and when you think you've got the length you want take that finger and stick it in there on your next wrap and that creates that loop like that so that on the next wrap you drop this right through the loop that you just created pull her straight down under pull it tight and right there is your snagging rig personally i've fished and caught these fish with weights made onto the hook. So I'm not a big believer that you need to have, you know, two foot between your weight and your hook. 
Usually I like about six inches, but that can range when I'm tying these up anywhere from three to three inches to a foot. Um, I like to hit all the fish on the bottom. I'm not out there specifically just after spoonbill. I, I'll catch whatever I can get my hands on. So I really like to have my hook as close to bottom as possible. Some people like them higher up because it'll kind of help you avoid some of the snags. If you want to see more, more details on um, rods and reels that I use, why I use them and things like that, I'm going to do an, uh, another video on that uh, going into a, a basic review of all my equipment. <clears throat> and I'll link that in the description as well as the other video that I talked about doing this in if you haven't seen that. So you guys can go check that out too. The other thing that I want to discuss is the species itself. I, I get, we, we catch a lot of, we catch a lot of hate from people who just aren't knowledgeable about the sport. And yes, I do call it a sport because I believe it is one. Now, a lot of people who aren't knowledgeable on snagging um, really view it as unsportsmanlike because they think that, you know, you're just raking a hook along the bottom. There's no skill or high energy output and you're just getting whatever. It's unsportsmanlike because the fish isn't eating it. I've had a lot of people who claim that uh, I'm killing fish because I'm snagging them and then releasing them and fish somehow don't live through snagging. And uh, I, I could point you guys towards papers all day um, that basically can outline for you that snagging is actually safer for the fish than hooking them in the mouth. There's less likelihood of them getting hooked in the gills. Actually, there's almost 0% chance of them getting hooked in the hills in the gills. Um, but I, I'm not going to focus on the haters a whole lot. What I, I, I'm just going to give you guys the facts. I'm going to try to stay away from opinion here. A lot of people in other states think that we're out here just harming and, and you know an endangered species and that's not the case these are not an endangered species we actually have a thriving population of these fish here in Oklahoma um, due to our very strict laws on them combined with the fact that the state does stock them as well but uh, we have a great breeding population on our own without the state uh, stocking them but once again that's due to ODWC's great job with the regulations and uh, you know it's up to us to follow those and keep up with that so that we can help the species thrive in the future. There is a lot of effort that goes into this. If you haven't done it before, it's physically taxing. It, you're going to go out, you're going to have to hike way in there with a lot of weight and uh, you know you hear about musky being the fish of a thousand casts or the fish of ten thousand casts. Well, I'm here to tell you guys when the water's up, this is the fish of a hundred thousand casts. You might stand out there and cast weights all day long and hit one fish. And you know, that's not a big deal when you're throwing a bass lure, but when we're talking about throwing around three ounces of weight on a ten foot rod, it is exhausting. And the other part of it that's exhausting is the motion that you make to snag. Long sideways sweeps with all that weight dragging bottom, that it, that absolutely kills your back. And you'll learn that there are, that there actually is a lot of technique that goes into it, as far as uh, you know your sweeps, and uh, you know how to get fish hooked, how to fight these fish, things like that. But then on top of that, how to find the fish. And when it comes to how to find the fish, and this is I, I've kind of just learned all this this year. Um, you know, you can go out when the water's up. And, and just wail away at it until you eventually hit one, they will be in there. But typically, so once water temps get, get above, I wanna say it's 50 or 55, you'd have, to, you'd have to Google that specific number. Once the water temps get above 50, 55, these fish start to run up river. Now, they won't just run up river just for the water temperature. The other thing they need is water flow. So if you have water flow, but the water temps aren't high enough, they won't run. If you got water temps high enough, but there's not enough flow for them to get up river, they won't run. So what you're waiting on is when those water temps get up and then y'all get that first big rain and those rivers really flood out, that's when these fish are coming out of the lakes and getting up to your snagging spots in the river. Now, you can go out there and well away at it, like I said, with you know high waters and the fish all spread out. But what I like to do is after that first big rain, when the water temps are right and everything floods out, give it about a week. And when the water levels come down, all these fish are forced into the deeper holes. Any deeper than normal hole on a river, these fish have to congregate in there because everything else is too shallow for them to move around in. Now, when that water's low like that and these fish have congregated in these holes, that's when you can best target them. I hope you guys learned something from this. Um, if I said anything that you think's wrong, feel free to let me know. Um, I'm still learning myself. We're always learning as fishermen. That's kind of the point. That's the challenge. That's what makes it fun. Uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. Have a good one.